Good morning and welcome to Encompass Live, your weekly online webinar from the Nebraska Library Commission. I'm your host today, Michael Sowers, Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Krista is stuck in some meetings today, uh, some very important ones I might add. Uh, so I am taking over both uh, hosting duties of Encompass Live and my usual hosting duties of this month's Tech Talk with Michael. Um, today I have another very special guest on the line, good friend of mine, Bobby Newman. She's going to be talking about libraries and transliteracy, and as you can see here, I have that blog that she participates in up on the screen. Let me see if I have Bobby on the line. Bobby, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear you? Can you hear uh, me? I can hear you great. Okay, so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to let Bobby give a, a short presentation about just what the heck we're talking about here, and then I'm probably going to have some questions for her and uh, happily open it up to everybody else. Just like to remind you, if you do have a microphone, you can uh, just give a hand raise, and I'll turn your mic on. Everybody is muted at this point. And uh, we also have the questions area in uh, the GoToWebinar uh, software so that you can type your question in there. Also I will mention we are trying something really new at the moment. Um, we do have a hashtag set up for uh, the go to web or go to excuse me Encompass Live. It's Encomp Live. Uh, we do have Emily in another office here in the building kind of keeping an eye on there so if you want to use this, that as a back channel or you want to uh, submit a question that way we'll do our best to pay attention to what's going on there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and give Bobby permission here. Let her share her screen. And Bobby, you should have that option now. There we go. And go ahead and take it away. Yep, we can, we can see it. Okay, there you go. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Bobby Newman, and I'm the Digital Branch Manager at the Chattahoochee Valley Libraries in Columbus, Georgia. And when I'm not at work, one of my biggest passions in library land is this concept of transliteracy. And that's what I'm going to hopefully give you an introduction to today and explain to you why it's important for libraries. The definition of transliteracy is that it's the ability to read, write, and interact across a range of platforms, tools, and media. And I've had a couple of people ask me, well, do you really think that librarians are the best people to be defining this term? to working out the, the definition of it. And my response to that is that we're not. The term came from the Transliteracy's research project, uh, uh, which is at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and then was picked up by Sue Thomas out of the UK as part of the product and research in Transliteracy. It's now just transliteracy.com. But it's a group of researchers in the Faculty of Humanities researching in the Institute of Creative Technologies, and they're looking at emerging areas of the intersection of science, the digital arts, and humanities. So a couple of months ago, I came across this term, and it really, it really struck a bit with me. It was sort of all the things that I had been talking about and why they were important all rolled into one word. And it is coming. Change is coming. It's here, actually. Um, but by the time I think we see it, sometimes it's a little bit too late to do anything about it. The spotlight is definitely on libraries right now with all the challenges to budget cuts and funding across the states and um, in other places, I understand. And if you're not aware, the FCC is working on a national broadband plan, which is going to bring, hopefully, broadband and the technology you need to use it to uh, most of the United States, which is wonderful. But what we're looking at right now is sort of a convergence of literacy. So, the boundaries between information, um, media literacy, information literacy, digital literacy, technology literacy, these are becoming um, blurred because we're moving from consumers of information to producers of content. This is a big, big deal and it's happening uh, basically as I'm speaking. Now, what this does is it changes the way we interact with each other and how, what value we place on created content. So what we're seeing is that things that people need to know, um, critical skills like um, critical thinking, global awareness, media literacy, these are not being taught in school. You know, people are not being taught how to evaluate a web page and determine if it's accurate. Now, granted, there are a lot of people who still don't understand that the uh, inquirer is not legitimate media content, but <laughs> these skills are just getting more and more important. So, 
uh, access to information used to be through the written word. You had to be able to read and write in order to be a contributing, participating member of society. And that access now is moved away from the written word to technology. Right now, we're exposed to more mediated messages in one day than our great-grandparents were exposed to in an entire year. And I know this is overwhelming for a lot of people. All of a sudden, information is coming at us in multiple formats, print, audio, visual, video, anything you can think of. And um, just in case you think that you're alone in this concern about the effects of information and overload, I want to let you know that Conrad Gessner was the first to raise the alarm about this. In a landmark book, he described how the modern world was overwhelmed with data and that an overabundance of information was confusing and harmful to the mind. Um, and of course, the media repeated and echoed his concerns. And I just want to let you know that Conrad Gessner died in 1565. <laughs> his concerns were related to the printing press. So we've been seeing these concerns as we move along for information, the same concerns were expressed about the radio. In fact, concerns were cons expressed about schooling, that it was harmful to children. So we've got information coming at us in different formats, and our concern is nothing new. What we do know from the past concern is that we will get through it. Technology is evolving very, very rapidly. And I think my favorite example of this is that in 1976, which <clears throat> was the year I was born, so let's say 28 years ago, um, Steve Jobs built the first Apple PC in his garage. In 2007, the iPhone came out, and in 2010, we have the iPad. Technology is growing by leaps and bounds, and libraries, in some cases, are lagging behind in that. Now, why is that important? Because it's important to our patrons. Um, whether we like it or not, they're looking to us for assistance with these technologies. There is nowhere else they can go to get the help that they need with these things. And, you know, we can close our doors and declare ourselves the hollowed hall of books, uh, but we are failing our patrons if we make that choice. <clears throat> Life is getting um, more interesting. The, your health insurance plan probably has a website. Mine does. I have an account. That's where I have to go find out what's happening with all of my claims and my um, flex funding account and all of those things. Uh, government agencies are no longer issuing print forms. The IRS and the state um, tax places are not sending out print forms anymore. You have to get online and be able to download them. Banks are offering alerts and account balance information via text message or email. Um, the, I got a package on the way from the U.S. Postal Service the other day, and you can sign up on their site to get an email when your package is delivered. If you're working on the front lines of libraries right now, you know that um, patrons are coming in and asking for help for job search to look for jobs, and that almost all of that is online, and so we get this these patrons who don't have an email address, they're not familiar with the commuter, computer, and they need to know how to use these things just to be able to find a job. Education, there's so much. MIT has so many courses online now for free. If you are looking for education, there's a lot of free online opportunities. Um, of course, you know, there's still argument over the value of that piece of paper, but there are, there's a great deal that you can learn online. Federal laws, regulations, statutes, contact information for specific government uh, agencies, um, health information, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more. And so not just these parts of online, but also the fun parts too, which I think is what people often get hooked up on, um, that, oh, Facebook and all this newfangled internet. Um, the, right now, statistics show that the fastest group of Facebook users is women over 55. So it's not people my age or younger, but it's people um, my mom's age. So, and they are unfamiliar with technology, and we all know that the default settings for Facebook privacy are probably not the ideal settings. And if there's no one helping them through that or telling them to consider that, it may not occur to them. They need to um, tweak those. One of my favorite posts and an example I use over time is from lifehacker.com article about cracking weak passwords. And we all have heard you need a strong password, you need a complicated password, and people say, I, I can't remember it, I can't keep up, I have too many, I can't remember them. And one of the statistics this article shows is that with basic um, hacking software, it would take 5.15 minutes to crack a six-character all lowercase password. And just by changing that to a six character upper lower and character meaning at sign pound sign something, it would take it ups that time to eight point five one days. So some basic, very, very basic, like having a password um, thing, that's just not be being taught in school. And when I say this in front of a live audience, I usually see a lot of people um, making a note to go change their password. So hopefully a lot of you guys are doing that right now. The flip side of that internet is that there is a problem with access. Um, the the price of computers is dropping, which allows more pe people to own one.
free Wi-Fi is springing up everywhere. McDonald's has it. The, when I was in Missouri, the grocery, one of the grocery stores had it in their cafe. Um, so you can go just about anywhere and get free internet access. But for a lot of people, these are new experiences, uh, experiences they can have with no tracing, no supervision, and no support. And they are <clears throat> they're just being turned loose at them with no real instruction. So while I applaud the federal government's attempts at installing broadband, access across the country, there remains to be a lot more done with that to ensure that people are getting the access that they need. We know that students need connection to the internet for their school assignments, to apply for federal jobs, all these things. And although in, for a lot of us in libraries, this access seems sort of a given and that it's ubiquitous, it's actually not true. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development ranked the United States 15th among its 30 member nations in broadband adoption per capita. And according to the FCC, more than 100 million Americans don't have broadband at home either because they can't get it, can't afford it, or aren't aware of its benefits. The adoption rates in other countries are much, much higher. So what we're looking at here is this sort of digital divide. And that's what I want to talk about now is that there is a divide between those who can get access and have the ability to use it. And that's fine if you don't want to get online and use Twitter, but that's not what this is about. This is about access to fundamental services and tools. So when I'm talking about things like the U.S. adults living with chronic disease are significantly less likely to have access to the Internet, this is important because not only does it create a gap in the information that's available to them, but studies show that access to an online network community, a support system, improves health, it improves recovery rates in cases of things like cancer, um, it improves isolation for isolate, feelings of isolation for people with um, chronic illness or disability. Same thing among seniors with, with families spread out across the country. An online system and network are so important now for this emotional support. And all the studies show that people that have this type of network um, live longer. I even heard it on NPR again today on the way in. So it's not just about sharing um, that cute cat video from YouTube. It's about really quality of life. The other side of that is this illiteracy that we're looking at right now where we have people um, that you've got the, this need for access to information. The Knight Commission talks about the inability to have broadband, broadband access for all. We're looking at a, a new category of second class citizens. And I just saw a report where they were saying, well, the mobile phones might help to, to bridge this divide. And yet studies show that the primary users of mobile phones for internet access are minorities. So to me, that's just, we're talking about, again, another category of second-class second citizens. Mobile phones are great, but you can only do so much on them, on them compared to the actual um, computers. I think the most important thing for us to remember as librarians as we talk about this is that the world is larger than the space you inhabit. It's very easy to look at the job you do at your library um, or what your friends and your family do in your spare time and declare that people don't need this access or don't need this service. Um, that may be for you, but your bubble is really big and it's very hard to get outside uh, the, your bubble of information. I love the quote by Douglas Adams where he observes that technology that existed when we were born seems normal. Anything that's developed before we turn 35 is exciting and whatever comes after is treated with suspicion. So I think we're all in for some real shocks, including me, who will be um, well, we'll see, we'll see how soon I'll be 35. But, um, <laughs> so, but libraries took up this call for literacy because it was important. We took up the call for literacy because we recognized the need and importance for society, and we need to shift, shift that focus to transliteracy. It's no longer enough to focus on the ability to be able to read and write. Um, we've got to be literate, transliterate, in order to be involved and contribute to society. This is a need that our patrons have. It's our responsibility to adapt and be able to provide that to them. And I'm not saying that we all are not get a Twitter account. That's not what I'm saying. I know people really love to associate transliteracy with um, digital literacy or media literacy, but it's much, much more than that. More than technology. I mean, be careful not to confuse transliteracy with technology. It's, it is information content, connection, format, texting, telephone call, email, instant messaging, voice, music, art, video, images, it is social networking, but it's also face-to-face, -face, paper and pen, gestures, which you guys can't see, but my hands are going like crazy because I'm talking, I get excited. Um, it's, it's expression, social, cultural change, uh, interaction sharing, so we're looking at much, much more than technology. The other flip side of that is it is a lifelong journey. You used to go to school, you memorized some facts, you passed a multiple choice or a little essay test, you declared yourself knowledgeable about um, the Civil War and you essentially moved on to the next thing that you had to learn about. 
Transliteracy doesn't work that way. You can't learn Flickr or you can't learn Facebook and, de and declare yourself transliterate. One, Facebook's going to change its privacy policies next week, but two, something else will come along that you're going to need to learn and adapt. It is about that ability to learn and learn and relearn. It's an evolving, it's a fluency. So what can we do as libraries? I know we're short staffed, we're short funded. Um, I would say the first thing we need to do is we've got to stop fighting amongst ourselves. There, there are, is a real um, divide, I think, sometimes between, I hate these words, but the Web 2.0 and the Web 0.0 uh, people that they, you know, people just turn their backs sort of on technology because there was this big rush towards it a couple years ago. And I think that neither side is totally right. What we need to focus on is what is best for our patrons. If it's what's best for our patrons, if it's what they need, then we do it. If our patrons don't need a Twitter account, we do not do Twitter. But if our patrons need help with their iPad, we give them help with their iPad. Um, that's our job. So we are risking becoming dinosaurs if we just stick our head in the sand and pretend this isn't happening. And I think that there are two huge responsibilities. One is if you're a techie like me, it's your job to lead from this day going forward. Um, you need to encourage staff. You need to be open-minded. If someone comes to you and shows you how they discover and tells you how they discovered Hulu this weekend and they got to watch all their TV shows online, you need to be excited for them. I don't care if you're like me and you canceled your TV a year or so ago and you get all your stuff through Hulu and it's old news to you. This is a new discovery for them. And I think that you need to remember that you can always learn from other people. And my sister is two years younger than me but decidedly less techy and less online than me. And she I remember on the phone the other day, she tells me they got this disc for their Wii that allows them to watch their Netflix movies on the Wii. I'm like, well, I didn't even know that was happening. One, because I have a Roku, so I already get a way to watch my Netflix. But two, I just missed it somehow. So you can always learn something from other people, always be open-minded. Um, and I would say that the flip side of that, the non-techies, you do need to get out of the box. You need to start exploring, um, take some initiative, learn about some things. Um, if it's what your patrons are asking you about, Take some time to learn those things. That's your responsibility either. I, I know it's not going to be easy, um, you're, but you are librarians. You don't have to know how to do everything right this moment, but you do need to be willing to figure out and able to find out how to use these tools. Uh, 23 Things is a, is a great program, and I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm running out of time. It's a good place to start. There are tons of adaptations of it now. Um, share your stories with staff. You know, it, at your weekly staff meetings, everybody share one new thing they learned. And I don't care if that new thing is a gadget or a, a, something they read in a print newspaper or in a print magazine or online. As long as you get in the habit of sharing it and respecting what other people are sharing, you're expanding everybody's knowledge. I think the biggest thing is just not accepting excuses. We can always we always have an excuse for why we don't have time or why we're not able to do anything. And the truth is, that if this is what our patrons need, that, that no excuse really is acceptable. We've got to find a way to do it. We've got to get on board, and we've got to move forward. That's it. If you want to learn more about transliteracy, because I went very quickly and I didn't have much time, you can learn more at a group our group blog. It's librariesandtransliteracy.wordpress.com, and the authors are myself. Uh, I'm a public librarian, Brian Holsey, who works at a college library, Buffy Hamilton, who is a school media specialist, and Tom Ipri, who is the University of Las, uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, who's an academic librarian. I'm done, great. Michael. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks, Bobby. That was wonderful. And yes, very, um, uh, 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 very fast. But that's okay. Um, so, okay, I just want to remind everybody, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A area. There, I am monitoring that. I have that up on, a, on another monitor here. Um, and I was <clears throat> kind of, a, a, for those who were in my tech night last month, I kind of said I, I kind of intentionally didn't do a lot of research this on myself. I wanted to come to it fresh and, and, and see what Bobby had to say, although I was aware of the blog, so I knew it was out there, and I, I think I will definitely now be subscribing. Um, but so, so I took some notes and, and some questions, and... Um, I guess the big one, which you just kind of barely touched on there on, on the last slide, and I've asked, I think, just about everybody I've interviewed in this Tech Talk series, is I don't have the time. How do you respond to that? I mean, I've responded to it. I know other people have responded to it, but I like to hear different responses. You know, I'm, I'm so busy. I'm, you know, we're in Nebraska here. We're very, a lot of very small libraries, one- and two-person libraries. I don't have the time. I'm busy checking out books. I'm busy answering those reference questions. And you know what? Now i got to make sure all the kids aren't fighting over the computers. 
-hmm. how do I do all this other stuff? What 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 do you say? Well, I, I actually recently wrote a blog post which made some people very unhappy. Um, <laughs> But essentially was my the magician is that you do. Every when you say you don't have your time, what you're saying is that it's not a priority. And we all have different priorities. I I fully acknowledge that. Um, you 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 choose to you know spend your time how you want. Uh, if you are this probably won't make you very popular, but I think as a professional librarian, you do have some responsibility to continuing education. Yes, it would be wonderful if we all got time and funding at work to do those things. However, that's not the reality. And because we're knowledge workers, we're not assembly line workers, sometimes that means we have to give up some of our evening time to learn those things on our own time. And there's all kinds of free online resources out there. Um, if your patrons aren't asking you about something, don't bother learning it. Yes, your time is valuable. But if they're asking about something, you're going to need to figure out a way to learn that. Oh, and I'd agree completely uh, on that, I would say. It, it is uh, priorities. I remember um, talking to David Lee King, and he was saying, you know, it, it, he, he echoed pretty much the same thing in its priorities, and he gave the example of the library book cart drill team. Uh, you know, it, it, it yes, it may be fun, but does it help your patrons? What are your priorities? And not that I'm knocking build, uh, uh, book cart drill teams. I think they're fun. But, um, okay, so we got a couple questions uh, coming in through the Q&A, so I'm, I'll try to integrate those in with, with the notes I took. Uh, Dana asks, what is the place of critical thinking and, ev and evaluation skills across all mediums in transliteracy concept, and how do we get all librarians talking the same language first? Well, okay, those two questions. I would say that the critical literacy thing, when you look at the definition of transliteracy, when you look at what T Sue Thomas and I are talking about it, it is all-encompassing. So all of those other literacies, critical thinking, information literacy, fall within this one larger category. Um, so yes, they're very important, and it's absolutely, I think, an incredibly important part of, of transliteracy. Probably right now one of the more important ones. The, the How do we get all librarians talking the same language? My answer to that is I'm not really sure, and I'm completely aware of, by using a quote, you can't see my finger quotes, a new word, um, like transliteracy, that it has caused a problem for some people. But the flip side of that, when I saw it, is that I saw it as a way to, to bridge that divide, that we have people who are so married to the concept of, of information literacy or um, that they don't want to do social networking or they don't want to have anything to do with technology, that what, by shifting the focus to one encompassing more, what we're really talking about here is what our patrons need. Um, information literacy is great. But librarians are like mad in love with that term. I think they would sleep with it. Um, it it's important, but they don't look at it for the neat, from, the, from the aspect of why our patrons need it. They look at it as a thing. Well, this helps them find, you know, the database information, so they don't have to bug me for it. Mm -hmm. It's about so for me, for me the the thing with transliteracy is that it does shift the focus. I hope shifts the focus back to the most important thing is what our patrons need. Okay, cool. Um, so, so here's my question. As as you were going through, I was thinking, and, and every time you you said, um, you know, what are our patrons asking us about? I, I I totally agree with. But do we have to? I I, I kept also picturing adult patrons. And and one of the notes I made is, well, okay, we do story time for kids. Do we need to start doing like transliteracy or technology? Even though it's not just technology, time for kids. Do do we need to maybe? Um, you know, if we've got children's librarians in the audience, is there maybe a different way they should think about this, or do you think it, it applies across the board? Well, I think that there's two parts of what, what patrons are asking for. One is my, my cautionary tale on that is just because they start asking you for a pony doesn't mean you have to give them a pony. Um, <laughs> I'm still waiting for yeah. minions. <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, when I say what your patrons are asking for, the, the thing with transliteracy is that, yeah, there's a need for it to be, um, just like we looked at literacy and information literacy and digital literacy, it's becoming a need for society. And, yeah, I think it would be great to get patrons in the door and offer some sort of training, adult training for them. Now, we, how you do that in your library and your situation and what they need, whether it's, you know, here's how you tweak your Facebook privacy settings or whatever, that's, that's a situation that will have to match your library. Okay. Um, Kate has submitted a comment here, I think, in, in relation to my question. It says, in Napa County, we have formed a terrific working partnership between the county libraries and the school district libraries 
it's a work in progress, but it has some terrific information fluency results for our students. Uh, she also has your preaching to the choir, to which, uh, you know, this is Tech Talk, you know, and um, the, the, the folks here are, are doing the continuing education. You're, you're doing it right now if you're attending. Um, so what I would suggest is when these recordings go up, and yes, you all will be emailed about that. I, I did get a question about that. Um, you know, pass this along to the people who aren't here today or didn't have the time to attend. So I and would encourage I, I would that. add to that that mm -hmm. a lot of what I've been thinking about lately is um, the sort of echo chamber effect. And I think Ned Potter from the UK has got some great thoughts and great posts about that on his blog. And I think it's the Wikiman or the real Wikiman.org. I can post a link later. But um, yeah, there is a problem, which if you sign up for this Tech Talk, chances are you are the choir. So how do I get my message outside of you guys into the, to the larger audience? I'd love suggestions. Okay, great. Um, and there will be links, ever, um, as those of you who usually attend Encompass Live, uh, there will be a delicious page with all sorts of things. I've already added a couple more things uh, to my list that, that Bobby's mentioned, and I'll get some links from her and add to those, and that'll all go out when you send out the recordings. Sheila has another question, and it was similar to a question I had, which is, could you provide an example of a public library service or program that builds transliteracy abilities for the library users? No. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> off the top of my head, no, I'm sure I could. I would say that's not true. I know that the, um, this, the, I always give the example of the Digital Media Lab. It's, it's a public library that Richard Kong put together, and I can include a link with that later, but they, they are, they've put together a Digital Media Lab for the patrons, and they're using it in that way, um, which I think is a great, a great tool. And I know that there are other things like that happening at other libraries, but that's the one that comes to mind first. Um, well, to put you on the spot just a little bit, make a tough question even harder, could you think of something that wouldn't involve so much money? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could. Um, I, I think that, one, a lot of times the patrons have these tools, and if you can get them involved in it, that they're willing to um, share or be involved in them. The other side of that is that there's a lot you can do without a ton of money. Um, there's, you know, There are grants out there and things like that, but a flip camera and... Some base, you can even there's a great amount of free online video editing software. So if you can get them involved to start creating content and start thinking about what they're seeing, there's all sorts of uh, resources out there about how to be critical and evaluative of, you know, for example, videos and movies and that you see online and what is the motivation of the person creating that. Sure. Class. Yeah, and an idea that just popped into my head would be uh, I know of libraries that have done kind of like a, a techie playtime or gadget garage, I think I've heard it called, mm -hmm. and things like that. And maybe you could get your patrons to bring in their gadgets and get them to talk about them. And actually, I've had a lot of success with that when we do our ebook workshops. I um, We have downloadable ebooks from Overdrive, and when I do the instructions and the demo, what I encourage patrons to do is to bring in their device. And what I find is that we end up with, one, a great variety of devices, way more than the library could possibly you know, have, or we could, but good grief. Um, and then that they're willing to share them with each other and talk about them. Mm -hmm. uh, Dana has a it's sort of a comment slash question here. Perhaps solution is mixing teaching tool specifics with underlying transferable skills to be able to navigate regardless of platform or medium. I, I would agree with that. Um, and I think completely. the trick is to always tie it into a need that the patrons have. I mean, you, having a workshop that says, you know, come um, learn, you know, how to do to, to use a flip camera isn't has some of the word to some people, but if you can tie it to a real need that the individual may have, um, you know, how to shoot home videos or mm -hmm. the best way to, to edit your child videos or you know something like that where you're tying it to an actual interest that they have, then that makes a big difference. Yeah, Dana followed up with, with for example, um, Facebook as, a plat as the platform for a privacy discussion. So you're all using Facebook, kind of add that privacy stuff on top of that. Um, Dan also says that they, they've done classes on enrolling seniors in prescription drug plans uh, with the help of the local pharmacy. So they've they've That's also brought idea. in, yeah, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> um, again, great questions, people. Uh, uh, please keep coming them in. Uh, one comment I had is I just want to stress for for regular listeners that please notice that I'm not the only person who keeps saying you need better passwords. 
<laughs> I noticed Bobby, although I will admit Bobby and I do disagree on, on some things about passwords, but well, we don't necessarily, but how often to change them, uh, but we don't yes, necessarily, that's a pretty, need, yeah. we don't need to go there. Um, so uh, let me let me ask one other question here that, that I kind of had, I, I'd be interested in getting your opinion on is, um, where do you draw the line between just being, keeping up um, with the technology, um, although I, I I know you don't want to say it's just technology, but that's where a lot of people end up focusing on this stuff. Um, it just, you know, drawing a line between keeping up and being on that bleeding edge. You know, I, I heard you mention, you know, Roku boxes and streaming Netflix over the Wii, and, and, and I don't know how many people in the audience even know what a Roku box is. I do. Um, but, you know, where, where is that line between just trying to keep up and, and bleeding edge? Well, I would say for me it's, and this is what I would recommend, other than what you think is necessary for your job, the, the reason I know about the Roku box is because I wanted a way to watch Netflix on my TV. So I was like, well, what are my options? And when I got to looking, the, the cheapest one, I don't know about now, but at the time was the Roku box, as opposed to I didn't have a PS3 or a, an Xbox 360, and I think there's a couple other devices it works on. So for me, it was just a matter of, I already had Netflix, I knew that streaming was available, I wanted to know what worked on my um, computer, which is the same method I tell you to take with your patrons. You know, if you, you have a problem, you're looking for a solution. If that solution is technology, then that solution is technology. If that solution is a hammer, then that solution is a hammer. Mm -hmm. I, I hooked up a full-blown PC. <laughs> To the computer, to the TV to, Yeah, to, to my TV in the living room, so, you know, hey. Um, Which, with uh, my new laptop and HDMI out is, is also an option for me now, but then uh -huh. you have the, the Roku still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's see here. We're looking at my notes. Um, the, Dan commented that Roku is great. Um, okay, so Dana asks, so real skill is ability to select proper tool for the job slash need? Yes. Okay, I would agree with you. And I, there's a great video, I have it um, bookmarked, and I won't have you guys watch it, that Brian Holsey did um, defining, can you still see my screen? Yes, yes, we can still see your screen. Yeah. Um, I have it up here. Um, Brian, one of our contributors, wrote this, uh, actually did this video called Transliteracy is a Blueberry Smoothie, where he talks about this blueberry smoothie that he found and like the recipe and how he goes through the different ways of sharing that information with different people. So he's choosing his tool, whether it's you know, printing it out and I think he mails it to his grandparents or something like that. He talks about those different methods, so absolutely. I think I'll have to watch that. <laughs> um, the recipe looks delicious. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Um, you, you gave a, uh, I think it was a Douglas Adams quote about um, with, uh, uh, a tool versus technology. The, the one I always like to use, I don't know who said it, is, is the definition of technology is anything invented after you were born. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. Um, if if I can keep you for a few more minutes, I want to change the topic just a little bit um, because you've been involved in another project this week that I've been kind of keeping my eye on just a little bit um, called Library Day in the Life. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell people what's going on with that. Sure. I'll pull it up. Library Day in the Life got started, oh my gosh, this is round five, 2008, and um, it came about because I was looking at the Voices Back back when I first began blogging, um, which really isn't that long ago for some of the old, old school bloggers, but I was looking through my, um, the search terms that leading people to my blog, I kept seeing the day, in, like, what's a librarian's day like, and I thought, well, we should, we should, all the librarians should start blogging their day and talking about what their actual day was, and so I kind of was, it was one of those things where I, I blogged it, I hoped other people would pick up on the idea, and we would all sort of share our, our day in the life. And the first round was in July, um, and there was a decent turnout, but it was, when it first started, I could read all of the blog posts, which is not no longer an option for me. And I think last round, round four, is when it took off. There's a Twitter hashtag for it now. Um, in, in this case, for the fifth one, it's live day five. And then there are videos on YouTube. Um, Catherine Greenhill from, from Australia did, did her YouTube video this morning. There are photos on Flickr, and there's a Facebook group for it as well. But the idea was that you're sort of sharing what your average day is like. It, it seems to be the most useful tool where I get the most feedback is from people who are considering an MLS, who are in school now for an MLS, or 
instructors of the MLS. And what we've done with the page, we've actually broken it down by round now so that you can see just who's done round five. And people are including the, their title and where they're at. So we do have international participants. Um, I'd love for this to break sort of break outside of the echo chamber of library land and, and see larger coverage of it, but it just really has not, um, as far as I know, happened. Okay. So if 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 I wanted, go ahead. Oh, it goes on all week, so it actually won't be done until Friday, even though it's called Day in the Life. What happened is that most of us don't have a, a, a quote-unquote typical day, so <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to blog a whole week and get a better perspective. So if you're wanting to participate, you have a lot of options. One, the first would be to add your name to this wiki, um, include your information. If you want to tweet your day, the hashtag is LiveDay5. If you're going to blog your day, please use the library Day in the Life as one of the tags for your post and then include a link uh, under here directly to those posts so that you know, we're not, three months from now when someone's looking for them, they're not searching back through your blog archive, but that link will take them right to it. Um, there's a group on Flickr, there's a Facebook group, and um, YouTube, I don't think we can do groups, but just go ahead and use that live day five and, and post it here. Well, I'm, I'm glad you hold it to a whole week uh, or give us a whole week because I have some very boring days where there's nothing really to write about. Um, but today is a lot more interesting, so I'm thinking tomorrow I'll write about today. <laughs> what I found um, with my new job is it's not nearly as exciting as my old job was. I mean, it's great for me, but to read about it, it spends, it's a lot of time writing policy procedure and reading emails. <laughs> yeah. 605, checked email. 610, checked email, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, any other questions for Bobby about any of this? I mean, I, at this point, I would encourage uh, everybody to um, participate in Day of the Life if you get a chance. I, I think it's great. I know I've done it in the past. Maybe I did it last year. Uh, I'll have to go back and look. I think I'll, I'll do it this year. I've been working on another, trying to write 30 blog posts in 30 days uh, uh, project this month. So if I can do double duty on that, I, th I think that'll help my blog out just a little bit where I can participate in that and write a blog post all at the same time. So well, One more um, thing I wanted to add. If you don't Twitter and you don't blog and you don't do any of those things, you can create a page on the wiki and link to it. And we have, you can see them over here on the right-hand side um, where these, these posts are at here. Um, but mm -hmm. people have done that. So that's also an option. If you don't blog, you don't Twitter, or your Twitter account is private or whatever, here's another option for you. Okay, great. Um, and, and Dana asks, she's uh, suggesting here, how about a student slash patron day in the life sponsored by libraries? Um, could, could you see patrons somehow doing this? Or Well, YouTube recently did, um, I'd have to go oh, look for right. it, but YouTube recently did a big huge day in the life thing, which I think actually was last week. Saturday, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's that kind of thing going on. I think it would be great if someone would lead that. Yeah. Someone not me. <laughs> you, you mean you don't already have enough to do? I mean, you, you've got lots of free time, don't you? I'm finding that I learned, need to learn to say no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll buy you one of those t-shirts that just says no. I, yeah. I think I need, I need one of those also. So. Um, and the, the last thing, I was just looking quickly back through my notes again. Um, Bobby mentioned a, um, a thing from Lifehacker about how fast somebody can break through your password. Uh, one of the, the sites I'll be showing here when, when I'm done uh, talking with Bobby is, is actually the test where you put in your password. It will tell you how long it would take a desktop computer to break through that. So uh, I, I, I kind of tend to remind people every month about passwords. So there you go. Well, Bobby, is there anything else you'd like to say or share uh, for the benefit of uh, the group? I don't think so. Okay. Well, Bobby, I want to. Yeah, I know. We most of us could, <laughs> because we just get to sit and read at our desks all day because we're librarians, right? So mm -hmm. we need to talk to people instead some days, right? Anyway, well, thank you, Bobby, very much. I I really appreciate you taking um, some some time out of your day to uh, talk to all of us. Um, this is all being recorded, everybody, so you'll be able to. Um, um, watch this again, listen, pass along. We turn it into a podcast. I'm sure Bobby will be putting it on her blog. Actually, do you have a personal blog you want to plug real quick before I let you oh, go? Oh, yeah, I guess I could show that real quick. I had it, I had it up for the Defining Transliteracy post, but I blog, I blog at Librarian by Day, if you're not familiar with that. 
Um, I'm librarian by day just about everywhere, so Twitter, uh, Facebook, all those things. Um, Great. You can, of course, find me here. So Wonderful. All right. Well, Bobby, thank you very much. Um, I, and, and we're getting several other thanks coming through on, on the, uh, through the Q&A area, so I, I greatly appreciate you taking some time out of your day to talk to all of us. And you are, uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute your mic and take back control of the, of the, the software, but you are welcome to stay for the uh, rest of the session if you would like. Completely up to you. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right, so let me do a little switching over here for just a second because for those of you who haven't participated before, what I usually do when I'm done uh, speaking with my guest is I like to, um, I have some bookmarks and some stories and some news that I've been paying attention to over m the month. Um, you are welcome to write down this URL uh, that you're seeing on the screen right now. However, um, we ultimately move these bookmarks to a slightly different URL on the Nebraska Library Commission's account, and that's where we'll be adding some uh, more bookmarks. So what I would suggest is, is if you want any of these websites, just wait about 24 hours. We'll send you an email, and we'll send you all the links to, to everything that I'm, I'm talking about here today. And so um, I actually have a couple of links that are follow-ups to some stories that I, I talked about before, and uh, one or two that uh, Bobby mentioned, and, and I'll start off with this one uh, here, How Secure Is My Password? And uh, it's a really big site. And so this is a test. It doesn't keep your password. You can type something in that's kind of close to your password. But let's say, for example, here's a, a typical password I would use, and no, I will not actually read it out to you. And if it says there that it would take about a desktop PC 163 days to, to to do that password. So notice that um, you know I pick generally pretty good passwords, but I will admit these are all lowercase letters. There's no numbers. There's no anything else in here. So if I was to just add, say, a um, one more character and I added a percent sign, I'll tell you that much, uh, notice it just went up to a thousand years. So I've shown in the past sites that will say if it's a weak password or it's a medium password or if it's a strong password, this one actually kind of puts it into hard terms as to how long somebody with a good desktop PC would actually get into uh, your account or crack that password. So if you're wondering if your password's any good, you know, go ahead and check out howsecureismypassword.net. Um, I think it's just a very interesting way of taking a look at that. Um, jumping around a little bit here. Uh, Internet Explorer 9, and whoops, I just did something on my computer that I didn't expect to, so I will move this over here. Internet Explorer 9 is coming, and uh, they have what are called platform previews available, so if there are any web designers in the audience, you may want to take a look at this. It does install completely separately from any current version of Internet Explorer you have. It does not have all of the features. In fact, it's practically menuless from what I recall the last time I looked at it. But if you want to test out things like new standards, HTML5, that sort of thing, see what your website looks like in this very, very, very early version of Internet Explorer 9, you are welcome to do that, uh, download and install that. And as far as I know, it is only Windows uh, at this point. Uh, let me see if I can get my bookmarks list back here. Uh, because I accidentally closed that up. Okay. Um, mentioned last month some ways to do screenshots uh, where you don't need to necessarily download and install some software. And um, Krista sent me this link. She said she used it. This is actually downloadable software uh, that you would use. It's called Screen Hunter Free. Um, this is the one she used, works really well, has some basic editing in it, and ultimately doesn't cost any money. I personally have not used this, but like I said, Krista has, and she says um, she highly recommends it. Um, I personally use uh, something called uh, Snagit, but that is a uh, $50 piece of software uh, that uh, I've decided is important enough for me to invest it. But if you're looking for a free option, this could be one of your possibilities. Um, speaking of screenshots, if you are a Chrome user, uh, this is uh, an extension I found where it will actually add 
a screenshot button to your uh, installation of Chrome, and this will take a screenshot of a long web page. It will do a scrolling screenshot. Uh, so again, just another option for you if you are somebody who, who needs to get screenshots from things a lot and uh, are looking something for free. And this one is specifically for the Chrome browser, if that is your browser of choice. Okay. Let's do a few others here. Um, several months ago, I interviewed a librarian here in Nebraska um, about their use of OpenDNS for filtering. Um, you can go back into the Encompass Live archive and find that if you uh, are interested. Uh, we're going to not try to turn this into a discussion of whether we should be filtering or not. Let's just assume that you've made that decision um, and you're looking for options if you're going to filter OpenDNS is a way that you can, instead of using your ISP's domain name servers, you can use OpenDNS's servers, and there were some filtering options available involving a lot of checkbox, checkboxes. This month, OpenDNS has started a new feature called Family Shield, which is a one-check, turn it on or turn it off filtering option available to you. Um, I have not actually personally tested it. Uh, the kids in my house are, are in college already. Uh, we don't really have a lot of uh, filtering necessarily to do, but um, this is an option. It is free. It's very easy to set up. It's very easy to set up at the network level, and so if that is something you're looking for, you might want to take a look at this. Uh, Dana has said in our comments that she has found a one-button, no-download screencast tool called screencastle.com. Uh, for screencasting, I'm a fan of a site called Screen Toaster. Uh, there's several others out there. Uh, I will take a look at Screencastle. Sounds interesting. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit here in the interest of time. Uh, I'd like to point out Dropbox for people. If you're not familiar with Dropbox, it is a way to... Uh, upload uh, files to a website, send people a link, down, have them download those files. You can also use Dropbox to sync files between computers, which I do a heck of a lot of. Um, mainly I'm throwing this in here because I, I ranted on my blog last week about people sending me large attachments in email, and especially on our state email system, we have limited inboxes, there are speed issues uh, when I'm on my DSL connection at home. So I'm really just trying to encourage people to use Dropbox. So I, I'm using my platform here to, to, to get on a little soapbox there. And if you're not already using Dropbox, please check it out, especially if you transfer a lot of large files between computers. Library Camp Nebraska 3. Um, Everybody's welcome, but this will probably mostly apply to just those of you here in uh, Nebraska. Uh, but uh, we are having our third annual library camp. We are having it on um, October 13th in Grand Island, Nebraska as a pre-conference to our State Library and Educational Media Association conference. Um, it will be pretty much an all-day event. It is completely free to attend. And you can come along. There's no agenda until that morning. It's an unconference. It's been fun the last two years. Each time we've had about 50 registrants. We're, we're holding it to 50 again this year. Um, please, uh, if, you, if you're coming to, to State Conference this year, check this out. Um, even if you're not coming to State Conference and you want to come, you can register. Like I said, there's no cost for Library Camp. Uh, we welcome everybody to come and participate. It's a wonderful thing. And yes, Louise, I'm sorry. We are holding our conference the same time as Iowa's conference. I was really bummed out about that. I, I, I wish you could make it. Um, okay, one or two more here. Um, for those of you who are looking for uh, blog ideas. Oh, in fact, look at here. Here's Screen Toaster. Uh, so I'll show you that real quick. Um, as uh, Dana mentioned, Screen Castle. Uh, Screen Toaster, you don't have to install it. It's a Java application. You click Start Recording. It allows you to pick up a microphone, a webcam if you have one. It will re record what you're doing on your screen. I've written several kind of instructional videos this month for, for staff and, and some other projects. Um, so if you're looking to actually record some steps for people, um, you can go ahead. Um, and Sarah adds, Screen Toaster looks cool. Getting to see you through facilitators 
pretty neat a webinar feature. Um, if you're talking about my little uh, picture down here in the bottom, uh, teach me to read those questions before I read them out loud. Um, in this case, all I'm literally doing is um, I've got a webcam up on top of my monitor here, and we're sharing my screen. So I've got the webcam software on my desktop, and since I'm sharing my desktop, you can see me. Um, it's a little weird from our end, especially when it's just me and I'm this close to the camera, and I'm not actually looking at the camera. In most cases, I'm looking down at the screen. But uh, hey, you know, makes it a little more personable. Um, so back to what I was saying a moment ago. If you're looking for some ideas, this is, um, well, let's not go with that example. Um, let's do this. Uh, you type in a word, and what it's going to do is kind of uh, create a dummy blog post title for you. And uh, I don't know if you actually want to write these six bits of library advice that will land you in prison, um, although that, that could be a very interesting blog post. Um, uh, you can generate here 10 underappreciated things about a uh, library or libraries, uh, nine ways library can help a total system in prison. Okay, they've changed some of these things before. I wasn't finding some of those. But uh, welcome to live internet. Uh, so uh, let me move on as I uh, start to get a little embarrassed. Okay, last one I'm going to talk about, and then Dan, I do see your question there, so I will actually uh, open that up. In fact, let me read Dan's question, give people a chance to, to think about that. Um, Dan is asking if anybody in the audience has any suggestions for patron uh, printing software for controlling what print jobs, maybe paying for those print jobs, logging into those print jobs, other than vent print. Um, and I know, Louise, you're in the audience. Maybe I can put you on the spot. I know you guys are using something. Uh, at your library uh, that maybe you can recommend. If anybody else has some recommendations, uh, please go ahead and put those in the questions, and I'll read those back in just a moment. The uh, last site I'm going to talk about here is a new piece of software uh, that I just checked out. I've not had a chance to use, and this is something for the kind of uh, uber geeks in the audience, the people who do the technical support for computers. One thing you may have noticed is in Windows, if you ever have to boot into safe mode to try to fix a problem, one thing you cannot do while you're in safe mode is install and remove software, which is kind of annoying if the problem is being caused by a piece of software that you want to get rid of. Well, this little program, which I guess has been around for several years, but I just discovered it, it's called Safe MSI. You install this on a flash drive flash drive, and you get into safe mode in Windows, you plug in this, your flash drive, you run this little program, and that will turn on the Windows installer service, which will allow you to install and uninstall software while you're in safe mode. I think this is pretty darn cool. Um, I really don't want to have to use this, but I've been in those situations where safe mode is the only thing I can get to because of a piece of software I've installed and trying to get around that problem has been a real serious pain, and I think this is a possibility. So immediately, that piece of software has already gone on my flash drive that I carry with me everywhere, and uh, hopefully I'll never have to use it. So um, we've got a couple of suggestions for you, Dan, that have come in through here. Uh, Louise is saying Envisionware has good reviews, uh, but do not use Comprise. Uh, that sounds like one of their... Uh, uh, pieces. Maybe, Louise, you could explain that a little further. And actually, if you have a mic, Louise, raise your hand. I'll, I'll happily turn on your mic for you. Um, she says uh, that also that there's new print time management software uh, is uh, Cassie, which is getting excellent reviews, especially for smaller libraries. And then Allison is saying they use Lib Libreca, L-I-B-R-A-R-I-C-A. -I, -R -R -I, I have no how to spell that. Cassie. So, again, um, another recommendation for Cassie. So maybe Cassie is the software that you want to take a look at. Um, I, if somebody has a URL, uh, you could submit that to me, and I'll, I'll happily bring that up on the screen. I'm sure a random Google search on Cassie might get me some uh, non-relevant results uh, to say. So, and let's see, so let's pull that up here. We got a URL. And that didn't copy well. Excuse me just a second.
Okay. Librarica. Okay, that sounds a little better. Um, also, Sarah has submitted a uh, URL to a TechSoup article on PC management software. I will add that to the bookmark list uh, when we're done with the session. Um, uh, Luis and I actually wrote a book on this software, but it's several years old at this point, so I'm a, I'm a little out of touch with what the current state of this software is, so I do appreciate everybody uh, contributing that information there. Um, so I have one more site I want to show you real quick. I did mention that I have been creating some online uh, screencasts recently. Uh, this was for a little project that I contributed to this month called the Emerging Technologies Summer Institute. Uh, the idea here was that it was a blog that people could um, uh, participate in, and all of the submissions for the whole month are screencasts on how to do things uh, that you might want to do in a library. Um, here's someone describing how to use YouTube's audio swap feature. Um, here's somebody using Mockingbird to mock up websites. Somebody did one on Prezi, uh, one using Digo. Uh, here's one I did, which was actually mostly for some staff issues we were having here at the commission, but I submitted it on subscribing to RSS feeds and Outlook. So if you're looking for some neat little short tutorial ideas, uh, you might want to check out this blog. And um, I don't think she'll actually shut it down at the end of the month. So if you've got any you want to contribute, uh, just follow directions in the site, and she will uh, allow you to post your videos. So... Um, any other questions or outstanding issues uh, that uh, might be good for the benefit of the group? We're just about out of time here. Okay, seeing no more questions in the Q&A and seeing no hands raised, I am going to again thank everybody for attending and uh, especially thank Bobby Newman for um, participating this month. Um, I will add also, let me actually have a slide for this. We have some upcoming sessions. Uh, next week we have uh, someone coming in, unfortunately I don't have her name in front of me, uh, talking about what she saw was the, the best at ALA this year. And um, if you attended LA, ALA, feel free to uh, sign up again and uh, participate. We'd love to hear what you had to think about ALA. Um, again, on August 11th, I will be back giving a presentation on RSS. Uh, we found out that I haven't actually presented on that in quite a while here in Nebraska, so we're going to do that. Um, and then due to some scheduling issues, it will be only three weeks, not four, until the next Tech Talk uh, with me on August 25th. And at the moment, I do not have a particular person inter uh, to interview scheduled. I'm working on that. I've got a couple of ideas out there. And again, you can always send me... Uh, suggestions or of yourself or somebody else if you think they're doing something really interesting that everybody would like to hear about uh, in their library. So again, thank you all for attending. Thank you for your wonderful comments in the discussion uh, today that I think worked really, really well. And I'm going to go ahead and say uh, thanks and goodbye.